Mocha provides a very elegant interface with Nuke for 3D conversion. In this tutorial, we'll look at the entire 3D stereo conversion workflow using Mocha with Nuke. We're going to be using this clip right here, which I've carefully chosen because it's a very simple conversion target and we won't get muddled down in complicated issues. You'll find this clip, Lantern Boy, in the project media, and the other clip, the converted clip right here, Lantern Boy 3D. And if you've got a pair of anaglyph glasses, you can watch this in stereo. And you'll be able to see that we have very nice separation back here on the cliff wall, and then the stone wall in front, and then the ground layer, and of course, the boy itself. We'll stop that. The QuickTime codec for this video has degraded the stereo effect of this clip. To see how it really looks, play the Lantern Boy 3D clip directly on your favorite clip viewer. We'll start by switching to Nuke to see how the 3D conversion process works, then back to Mocha to see how to create the many rotos required for the conversion. The whole idea of the 3D conversion process is to create a series of depth Z maps to displace a card mesh towards the camera, then project the original clip on that mesh, then re-photograph it from two slightly different camera angles. You can see that here as we look through the two different camera views, on the extruded geometry. Now in this tutorial I'll be using a rather simplified process to avoid a lot of the complexities you would have in a serious feature film 3D conversion. We'll switch this viewer to the 3D view so that we can see what the 3D setup looks like. There's two cards, one for the background and one for the boy. Looking at the background card first, this is the depth Z map used to extrude the geometry. We can see how it was built up by looking down here. We'll start with the cliff. This is a simple shape that I drew in Mocha because the rock wall is going to actually define the leading edge. I didn't need to worry about that with this. Next, using the luminance from the original image, I've added a texture to it. Now that texture gives me kind of a fake lumpy rock effect like this. It's not technically correct, but it looks really nice. Next, this grade node is used to adjust the brightness and contrast in order to control the amount of extrusion. Now, the rock wall has a bulge right here, now you can see that, that's not reflected in the luminance of the original clip, so I'm going to have to help out. So I'm going to have to add some luminance to that area in order to bulge it out. I can add that bulge with this roto mask here, where I have just drawn a simple gradient, then use that as a mask with this add node here, in order to add this bright spot. Well, that bright spot will turn into bulging the rock face. We can see the effect of that as I toggle that on and off. Next, we'll take a look at the rock wall. Here is the roto in Mocha for the rock wall, which of course I have defined a very careful edge. Again, the addition of the luminance from the original plate. Again, another grade node to adjust its luminance. Now it's a lot brighter because I want to pull it forward from that cliff. I also had another issue. This side of the rock wall actually recedes from the camera. So I wanted something to push that away from the camera. So I drew this simple gradient with the roto node and then use it to mask off this add operation similarly to what we did with the cliff wall. You can see the luminance change in this part of the depth Z map as I toggle it on and off. And you can also see the effect that it has on the 3D geometry in the left viewer. For the ground plane, a very simple ramp would do. And here's all of them put together. We'll swing our 3D view around here. It just doesn't seem reasonable, but if everything is seen from the correct view, all these distorted and extruded things look just fine to the camera if you get the camera in exactly the right place. Okay, let's take a look at the boy. Here's the boy's Z map. And we'll play that. You can see it's got a lot of gradients to it in order to make it rounded. And of course, the brighter the luminance, the closer it is to the camera. So, let's take a look at the boy's mesh. Right there. Alright. This is the displaced geo node. And as I toggle that node on and off, you can see the mesh displacing. 
using again this luminance map here as a depth Z map. Also, let me swing around here and we'll turn that back on. I also added this transform geo node in order to shift its position from its original spot in the rear out in front. I wanted the boy on his own card placed well in front of the background in order to enhance the depth perception. We'll swing that back around here for a better view. Now let's return to Mocha to see how all these rotos were made and imported to Nuke. So you can see over here the list of shapes that were required to make our shot. Very important point is naming conventions. You'll have dozens or even hundreds of shapes, so naming everything carefully is extremely important for keeping the job organized and not making mistakes. Let's start by looking at the three shapes that made the background plate. Notice that the cliff back and the ground plane were very simple. The reason is they weren't defining the edge. The rock wall is. So I carefully laid this spline right along the edge of the wall because my production plan is to put this one over the others. So you plan the overlap and the underlap in Mocha that you plan to use in Nuke. Well, let's turn these off and turn on the shapes for the boy. Okay, we'll turn the mats on and we'll play that just to get a sense of what we got going here. So as you can see here, there was only eight shapes required to do the conversion of the boy. Notice the left hand over here. As we scrub through the shot, that shape actually disappears. Okay, we'll go back to the first frame, turn off the mats, and take a look at the shapes themselves. I'm going to zoom in here and get a closer look. Again, planning your layering order. I'm going to lay down the head first and the, and the left hand second, and then the shirt will go on top of both of them, and it will cut this edge for me. So again, I'm planning my overlap and underlap. Next, I'm going to lay down the right arm, which will go on top of the shirt, then the right sleeve, which will go over the arm and the shirt. And again, the right sleeve is going to define this edge for me. Let's take a look at the legs. Okay, the left leg will go down first because it's in the rear, followed by the right leg, and those, of course, will both be under the shirt. And last, the lantern will go on top of everything because it's over shirt and legs and everything. Now let's take a look at how we export these shapes to Nuke. We'll pan back down here, and I'll select the head shape, and we'll go to File, Export Shape Data. We'll select the Nuke Roto Paint node, only the selected layer, and copy it to clipboard. Now we can roll over to Nuke and paste it in. We'll now use Nuke to apply gradients to the Mocha shapes to create the depth Z map for each object in the frame. In Mocha, I copied the head roto to the clipboard, so now here in Nuke, I can just do a simple paste. Come over here. I already have a head, so I'm going to just do this one over here on the side just to show you the workflow. As we saw earlier, it's very important to maintain a good naming convention. So let's open up Roto Paint 7, and down here, it'll tell you that this is the head spline. So we can immediately go to the Node tab and label this Head. We'll go back to the Rotopaint tab. Now let's connect this guy to the viewer, and we'll bring it in and zoom in. So I can show you a very important problem you're going to have. When the Rotoshape node is dropped into Nuke, it comes in the left view only. If you switch to the right view, it disappears. So we have to fix that right away. Here's how you fix it. Not the folder, but the spline itself. There's your view left. So do a right pop-up and add right. Now, it'll stay on for both left and right views. If you don't do this, your shapes are going to disappear when you go to the right view. Okay, we'll delete this. And now let's take a look at the workflow for applying gradients to all of the shapes. Let's take a look at the head, for example. Of course, the head wants to become a nice rounded object like a globe or a sphere. So a simple way to do that is simply apply a blur to it. I'm going to set the viewer down so we can see it better. I now have a bright spot in the center that rolls off nicely to the edges, and that'll give me my rounded shape. It also introduces, however, this little hot edge. So I can fix that by applying a pre-mold operation. Next comes a grade node. 
Let's show you that. Which allows me to adjust its depth in the picture. Toggle that on and off so you can see the effect of the grade node. We'll put the viewer gamma back to normal and point out that all the other shapes are going to get a similar treatment because they're all somewhat rounded shapes. Except for the lantern. There's an exception. So let's take a look at that. Here we are. So let's take a look at the lantern roto. And it's kind of a boxy thing. It's not rounded, so I can't use the blur gag on this one. So what I'll do now is I'm going to draw a new roto that has this gradient to it. Again, we'll use the viewer gamma to show this. So it has a hot spot here at the edge, and it rolls off nice and flat left and right. I can then apply that shape to the mocha roto, and now I'll have a nice square edge here that falls off left and right. And of course, we'll add a grade node in order to adjust the brightness. We'll put the viewer gamma back to normal. And I'll rehome the node graph. Next, let's take a look at making a clean plate to solve an intrinsic problem in stereo conversions. I'm going to zoom into my flow graph to show you the area where I made my clean plate. And to see the clean plate problem, Let's go up to our left and right views here, and I'm going to toggle between left and right views. Here's the right view. Remember, that right view is offset from the left view. I'm going to turn off my fix, and look what happens. Because the right view is viewing the shot from a slightly different angle, I can actually see the boy that's embedded in the background plate. I don't see that with the left eye because I'm straight onto the geometry. So, we have to fix this. And that's what this does right here. Now I fix this with a simple cheat. I created an edge key and then simply translated the background over to duplicate it here. You can see that. Now I toggle that on and off. So I did a little cheat. For a real movie, you're going to want a more sophisticated repair procedure. But in all cases, you're going to have the same problem the right view is going to show a slightly different angle of the background, and your character needs to be erased, painted, or composited out. Of course, we don't need to make a complete clean plate, just the area that's affected. We'll turn that back on, so that we can take a look at setting up stereo cameras. Here's my projection camera, and we'll switch the viewer to 3D, and we'll look through the projection camera. The whole idea of the projection camera is it's absolutely perpendicular and centered on the card mesh so that you see no distortion in the picture. Then the left camera is placed in exactly the same location as the projection camera. Now there's this little zoom in which I'll explain in just a moment. So here we go. Projection camera and left view camera. Now why the push hip? When I show you the right camera you can see some of the background disappeared over here because this camera is viewing the scene from a slightly different angle. So I needed to push in a little bit with both the left and the right cameras so that I have a little bit of extra leeway on the geometry and the right camera will not go off the geometry. Now let's take a look at the actual stereo camera setup. It's down here. So the boy's deformed card mesh comes in here to the scene node and the background's deformed card mesh comes in there. We then have our left camera and our right camera with the left camera in the exact same position as the projection camera, just zoomed in a little tiny bit, and the right camera is offset a little bit from the left camera and angled in or towed in so they converge on the screen plane. Let me go back to 2D, and you can now see the left and the right camera views. There. Next, we just take those two scanline render nodes, one for the left, one for the right camera, use a Join Views node, and then send that into an anaglyph node. In this example, we're just creating an anaglyph version of the stereo picture. In a real job, you would render out both the left and the right view to separate files on disk. So there you have it, a 3D stereo conversion workflow example from Mocha to Nuke.